Um, good afternoon. My name is uh, Jamie Williamson. I'm the executive director of the International Code of Conduct Association, a multi-stakeholder organization based in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, which oversees the implementation of an international code of conduct uh, based predominantly on human rights instruments, uh, regulating and overseeing the operations of private security companies uh, globally, with a particular focus in complex environments originally. It's a pleasure to be moderating uh, this webinar, uh, which is uh, organized in partnership with the Center for Sports and Human Rights. And uh, the title that we have for our webinar is on mega sporting events, private security and human rights, uh, with a particular focus initially on the 2022 FIFA World Cup and the Commonwealth Games. A bit of background uh, to the webinar and why we've chosen uh, to address uh, these particularly important issues in uh, on an uh, area which is quite often a bit of a niche uh, sort of a discussion topic uh, the question of private security in mega sporting events and in sporting events full stop private security companies as a reminder provide a range of services at many of the world's biggest sport tournaments whether providing stewards for stadiums safeguarding hotels where players and spectators are accommodated providing bodyguards for the athletes and corporate sponsors. Private security personnel are the unsung heroes in many ways that help secure the world's biggest sporting stages. So how are the private security companies providing these services chosen and what factors influence the procurement process? Once providers are chosen, how can clients be confident that international labor standards and human rights standards are being respected. Whether it's related to the recruitment, training, or treatment of security personnel, how can tournament hosts, teams, and sponsors be assured their brands and reputations won't be on the line? Today, we aim to kick off a discussion of what it takes to understand and manage human rights risks at play in ensuring the contracting of responsible private security providers. As I mentioned, we'll consider two upcoming events, but not necessarily limited to those sporting events, the FIFA 2022 World Cup in Qatar, which is just around the corner, and the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham, UK. We'll ask how the organizers of these events can best be assured human rights are respected throughout the tournament's security supply chain. Along with these questions, we'll ask, what does human rights due diligence on private security providers look like? How important is stakeholder engagement in this process and how should it be done? What are the issues around long-term sustainability and economic development for communities where major events are being hosted? And how is private security connected? We'll naturally address a number of other questions during the webinar. To help us unpack these issues, I'm joined by four great panelists, whom I will introduce to the participants. Our first panelist is David Grevenberg, who's a Chief Innovation and Partnerships Officer at the Center for Sports and Human Rights. David, I see your name on the screen, but just put your hand up for those who don't necessarily see your name. Good afternoon. David plays a critical role in expanding CHR's drive to embed respect for human rights in sports organizations and events around the world. David joined the center after six and a half years as chief executive of the Commonwealth Games Federation, the organization responsible for the Commonwealth Games and Commonwealth Youth Games. Previously, David was chief executive of the Glasgow 2014 Commonwealth Games Organizing Committee with ultimate managerial responsibility for the organization's successful preparation and staging of the Glasgow 24, uh, 2014 Commonwealth Games where he oversaw recruitment of a workforce of around 1,400 paid staff, up to 15,000 volunteers, and around 30,000 contractor roles, as well as the procurement of over 300 million pounds worth of contracts to support the delivery of the games. David, welcome to this webinar. Next, uh, we have uh, Mahmoud uh, Kutub, who is the Executive Director uh, of the Workers' Welfare Department at the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy, the organization delivering the infrastructure and host country planning and operations for the upcoming FIFA World Cup 2022. Mahmoud also serves as the advisor to the chairperson in workers' welfare and labor rights 
at FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022, who are tournament organizers. Mahmoud has played a key role in shaping and delivering key legacy initiatives for the Supreme Committee, including the Workers' Welfare Program, ensuring its sustainable impact and legacy way beyond the tournament. Next, we'll have Eddie Stam, who is head of Uni Property Services at Uni Global Union. And sorry, Mahmoud, welcome to this webinar and to uh, this panel. Um, Eddie is the head of Uni Property Services at Uni Global Union. Eddie Stam represents unions in the cleaning and private security sector. Prior to joining Uni Global Union, Eddie worked for several Dutch trade unions as well as European federations since 1992 and has engaged with employers such as Philips, Scania, Airbus, ISS, G4S Allied, Securitas, and many others. In Qatar, Eddie represents private security workers. Eddie, welcome to this webinar and thanks for taking part. Last but not least, uh, Nula Walsh, uh, founder and CEO of Mind Equity. Nula is a board advisor, behavioral scientist, an award-winning marketeer with three decades in investment management, where she sponsored multiple global sporting events, tennis, golf, and rugby, to name some sports. Today, she is CEO at Mind Equity and a founding director of the Global Association of Behavioral Scientists. Her non-executive appointment portfolio spans UN Women, World Athletics, the Football Association, and the Innocence Project. Nola has also published in the Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Psychology Today on Decision Making, and in other journals, no doubt. Nola, welcome to this webinar as well. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing from the four of you. In terms of how we're gonna proceed, I'll have each of you speak for 10 to 12 minutes uh, on the issues uh, which you feel are appropriate, linked to the topic of this webinar. I'll, uh, at the end, uh, maybe have a couple of additional questions uh, before turning over to the next speaker. For the participants, um, please put in any questions that you have in the Q&A in written form. Uh, I'll try to address as many as I can uh, during the webinar, uh, but also I'll encourage panelists to interact with the participants if they're able to multitask uh, during the webinar and uh, provide any uh, sort of answers to key questions live. So with those introductions, and as a moderator, I won't speak much more uh, on this particular matter. Just to say, I'm actually quite excited uh, to be having this webinar. I think it's been a long time coming uh, for us to have these important discussions on the role of prior security in mega sporting events. Uh, I'll turn to you uh, first, David, and uh, ask you to speak a little bit about your experiences leading up to Commonwealth Games, uh, both in Australia and Glasgow and ask questions such as why is private security so integral to the operation of these mega sporting events? What are the human rights challenges, risks and opportunities in engaging prior security uh, providers? What are the most effective ways to assess risks and make the most of opportunities long-term? And also you know, speak a little bit about human rights impact assessments and what they mean for mega sporting events and for those bidding for those contracts. But before I give you the floor, I'd also like to maybe take a bit of a context beyond Qatar and the Commonwealth Games, and for a number of us to look at what happened over the weekend in Paris. And I think no doubt encourage those of you taking part in this webinar uh, and the speakers in particular, maybe to unpack some of those issues. You know, what are there any lessons learned that we can draw from that in terms of the role of prior security and how it's integrated into those operations and what it can mean for crowd management. So without further ado, uh, David, I'll uh, give you the floor. Uh, to speak for about 10, 12 minutes as you wish. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Jamie and uh, colleagues. It's, a, it's fantastic uh, to join this illustrious panel um, and uh, really talk about a topic that is, uh, you know, I have to say it's not only quite important, but uh, something quite dear to me uh, in terms of we are, you know, ultimately in the business of creating people's proudest moments. Um, when we talk about sport or ma major events or, or uh, entertainment, it's there to make people proud. Um, and in order to do that, there is a prerequisite of ensuring uh, that people are safe and secure in enjoying, in, in enjoying uh, such events. Uh, what's critical, I think, uh, before we jump into private security and, and 
why it is such a, kind of a critical, um, critical glue to ensuring the safety and security of events. Maybe it's a, a good point to start of where does it fit in with the overall security and, 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 and safety regime? Essentially any security uh, portfolio or, uh, or span of a major event in this day and age has four key elements, and that is counterterrorism, policing, public safety, and asset protection. And what you essentially, all of the, uh, the, the equipment that's used, all of the workforce and personnel uh, is there to, to, to really back uh, those four key elements uh, up to ensure that safety and security is there. Um, the unique aspect of uh, this is that every single context, whether you're in emerging markets, whether you're in more regenerative markets or more sustained markets, uh, whether you're working out of an urban environment uh, or a rural environment or something in between, uh, the, the risk for, uh, profiles are different. The legislation often varies. The experience and capacity uh, also varies and therefore the context and risk uh, varies. The role that private security essentially plays, you know, if you if you look at this in its broader sense of the category categories of uh, personnel that back up the safety and, and security regime, is that you have military, uh, mainly for counter counterterrorism activity or to fill gaps. You have policing, uh, which is their very strict mandates of policing and, and, and connected to public safety. Uh, regimes. Uh, often you have stewards uh, that are connected to particular venues and facilitating in-venue work. And then you have volunteers uh, that are often a major part. In some, some cases, these are very event-specific volunteers, or in other cases, uh, you have a cadre of volunteers that run from event to event in a particular municipality. What is unique is that somewhere between the police and the stewards <laughs> um, are this, this, this place called uh, private, uh, private security personnel. And private security, you know, whether they're, they're looking at protecting uh, an asset or they're protecting a designated site, um, or they're supporting the flow of fans into, uh, safely into a venue, they have a wide range of different uh, responsibilities or could have a wide range of responsibilities depending on the complexity of an event and depending on the robustness of legislation. And so I think it's important to, to say that it's private security at this point in time, from my experience, and I've had the privilege of both being a CEO of a a major event, as well as being the CEO of, uh, of an event owner. But I've also had the chance uh, to, to work with a number of different countries uh, and events in getting this conundrum <laughs> often right uh, for the benefit of a, of a great event. And it is probably the single biggest question, and I would say area for improvement uh, for standardization that is required. Uh, human rights really falls into this, this sphere on two fronts. One is that obviously any security personnel that you bring on to provide that safe and secure environment, you want to ensure that they have a good understanding and are trained well to respect, protect, and ultimately fulfill human rights standards and obligations. And so training is absolutely key to all the different roles and personnel. And that starts with really understanding your role and your responsibilities in that respect, protect, and promote uh, span. You then have, obviously, as a worker, you have your own rights, and those rights need to be protected. And often, you know, obviously, uh, these, these mass contracts, particularly with uh, private security, are looking at a mass amount of uh, labor. That is, being, that is being managed, which has lately huge, huge 
uh, risks, but also huge opportunities in terms of managing a large workforce. And so if you look at private security as another genre of workforce, you need to ensure that their rights are protected. So as individuals and as workers. So that's kind of the span of when we look at the human rights aspect, the ability to respect and protect and promote human rights in doing your job, but then also ensure that your human rights are respected, protected as a worker. And that is critical. And I'll get into some examples around, around this. Some of the other points I wanted to just kind of raise in terms of what's critical ensure, to ensure that private security understands its remit, uh, it really starts at the bidding phase. Uh, what we're seeing now is that human rights assessments, along with risk assessments, through wide stakeholder engagement exercises are being conducted at the feasibility and candidature phase of many major sporting events. And this is to ensure that there's an essentially, with all of this understanding of the context and the situation, that there is an agreement on how we are going to cooperate and ultimately who is going to be conducting what. Through these assessments, which is essentially an, uh, a, a due diligence exercise, which includes impact assessments, both the risk impact, as well as the opportunity or value impact, uh, you, you learn to understand where the gaps lie in terms of the regulatory frameworks. Many, many organizing hosts have gaps in their frameworks. They have many, in many cases, we have, we're, we're hosting events in a particular place that has never been done before. So whether it's Glasgow hosting the Commonwealth Games, the Gold Coast hosting the Commonwealth Games, or Birmingham hosting the Commonwealth Games, all three of those locations, as an example, it was the first time a Commonwealth Games had been hosted <laughs> of that magnitude, of that size. Um, and that, and that, that really is a, a, a recipe if you do not go into it with, as, with the attitude that you have as much to learn as you have to contribute, <laughs> it, it, it's a recipe for either success or disaster. Um, so understanding what regulatory frameworks exist and which, which frameworks may need to be put in uh, place are another critical piece to establishing this good cooperation and, and helping private security understand and have a firm footing in terms of their mandate and ability to exercise their role. The, the third point, after having that agreement to cooperate, this regulatory understanding of the regulatory framework is to ensure that you have integrated planning. And this means that security and the private security solution um, is well scoped with, with good reason and good rationale. There's two elements to this. There's the strategic element, which is really focused on what is the delivery model. Some environments may require more police presence and more military presence. Others may require less and more private security and steward-based steward presence. It really depends on the context, context as well as the risk profile of the event. But essentially a strategic overview of assessing the market is absolutely critical to ensure that the scope and scale of private security is, is, is appropriate. And then comes, once that is uh, determined, that delivery model is determined, then is, comes in the, the operational detail planning. And they have to be included, not as an afterthought, but as a forethought in terms of the, the, over, the overview. And that may even be sp site specific when you're dealing with a major sporting event. Again, you may have a particular venue that is actually better serviced by a heavier police presence um, and military presence and, and, and has less presence of, a, uh, of private security because either of the risk profile or obviously the, the capacity. Um, so I think these are really important elements is understanding the cap capacity 
and the capability of each of the actor groups in the security profile ultimately determines the success or failure of the private security solution. They are there to kind of supplement the stewards and the volunteers, as well as some of the policing and counterterrorist terrorism forces. And it's really, really important that uh, you understand the gaps um, in this. Um, the other aspects, and I think the critical pieces uh, to ensuring that private security are not our forethought and not an after, afterthought, which often, because they kind of fill gaps, they're often placed in that, uh, that, that afterthought mode, is to, is to have the procurement of private security early enough on in the process that they're included in the C, C3 or C4 uh, construction so that the command control uh, communication and coordination efforts uh, include private securities mobilization and considerations that they are included in the testing and readiness. Again, often those aspects are critical for the training, uh, training focus. So all of this requires early forethought and a good understanding of the environment. I've seen a number of cases where either because there is limited capacity um, or limited, even limited capability uh, of private security that you're supplementing private security as an afterthought. Um, and that is not necessarily always a failure, but there are enormous risks with that in terms of you know, delivering. You can't just throw numbers at this and, and expect for everything to be okay on the day. The importance of adequate and uh, robust training, protect, particularly now that we live in a world that is under enormous scrutiny around the respect, protection, and promotion of human rights, particularly with the diverse vulnerable groups. When you're putting people in unfamiliar environments with particularly unfamiliar populations, you are maybe adding to the risk if these training elements are not taken into consideration uh, and robust, robustly prepared for. Um, and then I think really the other, the other aspect um, of this, which I think is important to note, is that the single source solution versus a multi-source solution, uh, the past several events that I, I, I have been involved with um, have really required multi-source, being multiple uh, contractors in this space uh, versus a single contractor solution. It's depending on the size of the event, if it's a single sport event versus a multi-sport event, um, single location event, so a single stadium versus multiple sites, all of these elements really come into to play when you're looking at the solution. And so for a multi-sport event like the Commonwealth Games uh, in, in, in Birmingham, Glasgow, uh, and in Australia, there, there really was no solution <laughs> better than a multi uh, a multi-source solution with multiple contractors, both in terms of our own resilience. Uh, so if we, if for, for some reason, a contractor is unable to deliver uh, or that you have significant attrition um, because, of, uh, because of various uh, issues, whether those are natural issues or uh, issues regarding just the quality of treatment of some of, uh, some of the uh, private security personnel, um, those issues, you know, you need to be able to bounce. And so having multiple baskets <laughs> to place the eggs give you, gives you a much, uh, a much better, uh, I would say, risk uh, tolerant uh, structure. So I think these are, these are some of the points that I, you know, I'd like to just to start off, start off uh, the conversation with. Uh, the, the biggest point that I, I, I think in response to your, um, in response to the issues that, that occurred over the weekend, I think there is a really important element to recognize there was a fundamental failure in the last mile in the lead up to the, from drop off points for transport and the lead up to the venue. From what I can assess and from what uh, we've heard, you know, on the ground, um, this is 
often, and not unique to this event, that is uh, often positioned as the gray spot or no man's land. Um, and what it needs to be in any major event, that buffer zone between your first approach, your approach to a venue needs to be well, have good signage and incredibly well-trained people <laughs> to be able to give you the, the direction that you need, but also ensure your, your, your safety and security, both uh, coming into a venue and of course, uh, departing from, from a venue. Uh, I think that being said, um, happy to talk about stakeholder engagement when we get into some of the discussions. Uh, the biggest point of stakeholder engagement, it starts well, well, well before an event is, uh, is being hosted. It's an ongoing uh, process with communities around the hosting of events. It needs to be inclusive. It needs to have materiality, meaning that you're actually talking about what's important to these communities um, and to all the stakeholders uh, involved. And there needs to be a degree of responsiveness. So I've kind of graduated uh, in all of these areas. Um, you know, if you want to get the best out of a security solution and particularly private security, understand the environment you're working with and most fundamentally understand the stakeholders. What are the sensitivities? What are the, the fears, uh, the, the, the angst, but what are the ambitions uh, and how are people looking at an event uh, in, a, in a locality? But uh, yeah, again, a very, very important uh, area. It is essentially uh, what holds the security solution uh, to many events uh, together. And uh, I'm really happy we're just having this conversation. Thank you very much, David. I mean, there uh, you've touched upon a whole range of issues, um, everything from the operational uh, to the broader uh, sort of planning uh, kind of uh, aspects. And I think the, the points, well, there are quite a few points I picked up on, but we'll um, work on those as part of the conversations. The question of the, the forethought and afterthought. I think that comes up quite often uh, in our sort of line of work as a multi stakeholder organization working exactly on these issues of security and human rights. Um, we have seen this, uh, this point come up over and over again, uh, failing in many sectors when using or hiring security providers in actually integrating uh, that into the processes early on and higher up the supply chain as such and as part of the planning processes and the procurement processes. And that's from the operational piece in terms of the service being provided. But then you have that layer of the human rights considerations as well. Uh, and so, yes, we speak about training and capacity building on the operational aspects, for instance, on crowd management. Uh, but then if you are speaking about afterthoughts, the human rights piece in terms of how prior security is provided or the human rights protections of prior security personnel can quite often see, be seen as a double afterthought, uh, to use some pretty bad English there, and much further down uh, the planning process and way beyond the procurement process. And that's something I think uh, your organization, ours and others, are trying to roll back, uh, make it clear that when we're dealing with private security providers and the human rights considerations, they have to come uh, much higher up in terms of considerations. I think FIFA did that as part of the 2022 and 2026 bidding uh, books where there was a number of uh, specific references to human rights and some limited, but nonetheless important references to security as well. So hopefully we can learn from that in other environments. And then on the, the question, there's a couple of questions that came up on Paris as well. So you've partly addressed them, which is good. Uh, that gap, you know, you mentioned military, policing, stewards and volunteers, and that prior security sort of fits in somewhere between policing and stewards, depending on the site, depending on the needs. The question I would have, but uh, maybe it's more uh, sort of, uh, it's in a crowd management situation on your experience, right? The stewards have a particular role. The police have a particular role. But when you're dealing with thousands of fans in a potentially very difficult environment, and in some locations with fans in some sports who tend to like to drink a bit more than they should be doing, on the regular day, can you realistically expect private security and stewards to double up alongside the police to effectively manage crowds of such sizes? Or is this something that has to be much more well thought out in terms of integrated policing and security management of that situation? 
I, I, I would say, I think you answered the question. <laughs> I, it, it has to be planned early and understand the integrated nature. They're not prepared quite often uh, to uh, take on those responsibilities of policing uh, a situation. Private security is there typically to protect assets and to ensure safe passage um, of people. It is not in a, when there is criminality that is uh, occurring um, or there is uh, threat, threat to life situations, um, there is an escalation element. And so I would really question you know, whether private security has been brought into uh, to, to, to a situation to, to, that, that is adequately trained to deal with such an emergency response. Um, because it's, it, and we know it can quickly move to an emergency response if that pre-planning has not come into play. And I think it's an incredibly unfair position to put private security in um, if both they're not legislated and protected to be able to fulfill those roles and responsibilities, or there's uh, dubiety or uh, uh, ambiguity in between, um, you know, where their role sits and, and others uh, and others sit. So I do think it is an area. In my experience, you have books like the the, uh, the Green Book uh, in the UK that uh, I think go a long way uh, to give us guidance. Very football centric uh, in terms of its response. Um, and I think with the hosting of multi sport events, you start to you start to get uh, more more experience in these areas. But I do think it is it, there's a there's a gap in the market, and this is definitely somewhere uh, I think all of us can work uh, together to come up with some some guidelines and standards to help organizers, to help major event owners, uh, really deliver on that promise of creating a you know the proud moment, but but one that's safe and secure as well. Excellent, thanks, Art. And there's plenty of issues we'll come back to. Um, David, thank you very much for those uh, sort of opening comments. Uh, Mahmoud, if I may, I'll turn to you uh, at present. You've heard you know, quite a few uh, elements and experiences uh, sort of uh, discussed and presented by David uh, from his own work uh, with the Commonwealth. Um, you know, listen to his experience. Uh, are there any sort of similarities, differences uh, that you could point to with regard to the situation in Qatar in terms of the kind of human rights challenges, the risks and opportunities in engaging prior security providers in Qatar? And also, you know, we're not there yet. Uh, we still have another six months to go uh, before the World Cup. And of course, challenges in ensuring that at the time of the World Cup and hosting of the World Cup, uh, the prior security element is uh, properly managed and is able to uh, fulfill its role without any potential human rights uh, concerns. Mahmoud, uh, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jamie, for the introduction. Thanks, everyone. I'm delighted to be here today to discuss this important topic. Clearly, it's uh, very well timed, uh, indeed. Um, I think, you know, again, uh, acknowledgement to, uh, to to David uh, for providing a very comprehensive uh, outlook on the ecosystem of uh, security uh, security companies and safety and security by uh, at large. I think it's clearly many many different players that that are involved in ensuring a safe and secure uh, major event. In fact. Um, and of course, human rights is really at the uh, at the at the sort of the clear foundation uh, that runs through some of these key elements that we're considering today. Now, of course, from our perspective and my perspective specifically, I'm going to be looking at or giving you an update at least on the rights of those security private security guards and ensuring that their companies and the regulators that are overseeing their work are, are ensuring their rights are protected. Um, and this is where my team specifically is focused on very, very heavily. And of course, part of it is capacity building. This is something obviously David touched on. You can't have enough training and capacity building and knowledge sharing amongst various security providers, both domestically here in Qatar as well as internationally. Um, now, of course, we are literally less than 200 days away from this historic tournament. This is the first uh, World Cup in the Arab world. We're obviously quite excited uh, to host it. We've come a long way on this journey towards delivering this sporting event. Now, as an organization, of course, this journey has never been about football alone. Uh, I joined in 2009 during the bidding committee days specifically because of the legacy aspects of this World Cup. I love football like the next guy, but it was really more about how we can really le leverage on this great tournament uh, to serve as a catalyst for the wider reforms at the state 
had embarked upon, but also I think uh, the society at large, I think both within Qatar as well as the region and globally. And we recognize this great responsibility of protecting the rights of every worker, individual involved in, uh, in delivering on this tournament and the immense role that we had um, as an organization. Um, now, as you, all of you may be aware, Qatar had embarked on extensive reforms over the past few years that have strengthened existing legislations and have provided increased protections for migrant workers. Uh, of course, workers, to give you some example, workers are no longer required to obtain ex exit permits to leave the country. No objection certificates have been uh, eliminated, which allowed them, which forbade them or complicated their lives in terms of changing jobs. So effectively dismantling of the kafala system or the sponsorship system that, uh, that exists in Qatar. Uh, they've also introduced a non-discriminatory minimum wage. This is the first in the Middle East. Now, these are, of course, historic reforms, unprecedented for the region. And we believe the work that we have played in this organization, the Supreme Committee and delivering on the World Cup, has accelerated this na the nation's strategic efforts in improving the welfare of migrant workers. I'd like to briefly highlight today uh, our progress in protecting the working conditions and labor rights of workers across the program, and particularly those involved in private security. I'd like to step back, perhaps back to 2014, when we first set out on building the infrastructure, which was an important uh, milestone uh, in the establishment of the Supreme Committee for Delivering a Legacy. And this was really, really when our experience with private security began. Um, our mandate had covered up to 30,000 workers at the time, including private security personnel, which was the peak of construction of the stadiums uh, that are expected to, uh, to host the tournament. Uh, and this was a pivotal phase for us, allowing us to understand the challenges associated with the sector and work very closely with security service contractors to raise awareness of our workers' welfare standards and their contractual obligations. Now, as we inch closer to the tournament, with the majority of the stadium construction now completed, our focus has shifted to the tournament-centric services. And these are the projects that make up the host country operations for 2022. We have worked diligently to transfer the learnings from the construction phase over to the wider services sector, with our mandate now covering over 150,000 service staff involved in hospitality, safety and security, transportation, logistics, and other professional services. We are anticipating about 159 hotel operators will be utilized for the tournament, all of whom have a dedicated team of security personnel on site. Um, 78 of those, hotel, of those 159 are already falling under our remit, uh, and they are implementing the workers' welfare standards, and the majority of them have been audited and inspected by, uh, by my team on the Supreme Committee side. Additionally, there should be, we're expecting around 23,000 security personnel to be deployed during the tournament. Um, and of course, their expectation is to deliver a safe and secure tournament experience for football players and fans alike. We're also leveraging on existing relationships with private security contractors to secure our standards, to ensure our standards are being effectively implemented for the wider security force. Now, of course, an important point that's something David touched on about the importance of starting at the bidding phase. This is absolutely essential. Um, you can't retrofit this, really. You have to really ensure it's integrated. And a lot of the work that we have done with the construction side of the business, as well as the service providers, has been to integrate these workers' welfare standards within the contract. There's no surprises. Everyone knows what they're signing up to. And they also know what the enforcement measures that we have at our disposal that can be leveraged. And of course, security personnel very much fall under the remit of our workers' welfare standards. These standards are the cornerstone of our program and have been developed to ensure the health, safety, and welfare of workers. We published them in 2014 after a detailed consultation with government, uh, civil society, and international, uh, international governmental organizations as well. And they include three main pillars. And these are very important because they really drive the direction of our program and our oversight program. First, is ethical recruitment, of course, and that's, that's integral to ensure that the workers are protected from the time they are hired all the way time to their repatriation. And it covers things such as ethical recruitment, employment contracts, salaries, overtime, and leave, etc., amongst other things. Second is accommodation, to ensure that workers have decent living conditions. This includes the provision of meals, transportation, leisure facilities, and medical facilities. Our standards are unique in that the contractor and the employer is responsible to cover these, the provision of these services free of charge to the workers. And third, of course, is the work environment to establish a sustained culture of safety on and off site. Now, the standards, as I mentioned, are embedded within the tendering process and are contractually binding. Compliance to the standards is a prerequisite for any contractor, including security service providers. 
bidding for our projects, which effectively means that due diligence really begins at the tendering stage. This is absolutely an integral component here. And our system is binary. During the actual bidding phase, if a company fails on workers' welfare and labor rights requirements, they are automatically disqualified. And this is quite unique. And as a result of this process, a significant number of companies failed and they had to go back and they had to do their homework and improve the conditions and they were able to bid again. And in, some many, in certain cases, they've actually won, which again, it encourages, it really puts the labor rights and human rights at the forefront of our work, which is integral. Now, of course, early engagement with contractors is absolutely critical. And we as at the SC have worked proactively with all contractors to help them understand their contractual obligations and implement rectification measures as part of our tender evaluations. It's a loop, it's a feedback loop that we are constantly engaging with contractors to understand what we expect from them uh, and in turn what we expect from them to deliver to their staff and employees. Give you some numbers. I mean, we've, we've engaged with about 23 security companies from the construction phase all the way to the hospitality sector phase. These are the big names and big brands in Qatar. And only eight contractors were approved and mobilized with the remaining ones actually having failed at some stage within the tendering process. And in some cases, we would demobilize after not meeting the requirements uh, of the workers' welfare standards and the Qatar labor law. So the system has teeth, it does work, and companies are penalized if they do not uh, comply. Now, of course, as I mentioned, the feedback loop is critical. Awareness is absolutely mandatory. And this is something that's integrated within the fabric of our program. Constant awareness and training is something that we provide. My team, we have a specialized team that actually delivers on training to the security companies and the wider service sector. And all approved contractors upon deployment are subjected to a rigorous due diligence system that we have, which is a robust four-tier system. It includes self-audits by the contractors. We expect the security companies to self-audit, to audit their supply chain if they have one, if they're not hiring directly. Second is us at the Supreme Committee and Q22, which is the local the tournament organizers, where we carry out 100% audits and inspections over uh, the contractors engaged with us. Third, we have an external monitor that carries out their own independent audits. This is a social auditing firm called Impact out of the UK that has been our partner since 2016, have played a key role really in keeping us really sort of a health, healthy tension uh, between us. And last but not least, of course, the inspections by the Qatari's Ministry of Labor. They have a very key role to play uh, and we work very closely with them to ensure that whatever issues that arise within our sort of sphere of influence is also extended and cascaded to the wider society. Now, of course, our objective is not limited to auditing contractors, as I mentioned. We do educate and engage with them through various capacity building initiatives. And this collaborative approach has been absolutely instrumental in ensuring a cadre of uh, compliant, uh, sustain, again, for us fundamentally is about not just achieving, but sustaining higher levels of compliance. And as I mentioned, we do have enforcement measures. And of course, if major or persistent non-compliances continue, we have applied them, and these have been in the form of blacklisting, putting companies on a watch list. These all have been effective um, throughout the course of the past six years. Now, one of our testing grounds, we've shifted gears really from the construction to the tournament, as I mentioned, and we've also now started to pilot, and we did this through the Arab Cup that was held in 2021, to understand the resilience of our due diligence systems. I mean, I think ultimately event time, this is a very, very new experience for a lot of people and how to ensure that human rights and labor rights is honored and respected during a major event is absolutely key. And we use the experience from the previous mega events. Again, as I mentioned, the FIFA Arab Cup that took place in December of 2021. We also had the Club World Cup that was held in Qatar. And so we focus on three key elements during the due diligence phase. One was pre-event due diligence to assess the contractor's compliance with our standards. Second was tournament time inspections at various venues. This was the first time, as far as we're aware, that the human rights team was deployed at a major event, interviewing workers, ensuring their rights were protected, ensuring that they were not being exploited and working exorbitant hours. Um, and lastly, post-event enforcement to ensure that appropriate actions is taken to rectify issues identified during our inspections. Our experience with the Arab Cup and other FIFA test events provide us with a lot of insight into the systemic issues that can occur on a major event. And this allowed us to identify areas within our own due diligence tools that needed further reinforcement. For instance, since we typically audit 100% of contractors that are active on our sites, we faced a challenge around identifying and auditing contractors that were on call-off agreements and had not deployed any workers. 
And this is quite common, by the way, in any mega event where you do have call of agreements with service providers and that you would only leverage on their services when the event occurs. Because of that, and this was a gap that we identified, in fact, as a result of the Club World Cup, we've revised this approach to audit and inspect all contractors, this, regardless of the type of contract that they hold with the SC or Q22. And this is important. Regardless whether you deploy or not, we are out there making sure you're aware, you understand the, right, the, the workers' rights, we understand that you're applying the law, and you will be held accountable. And in cases where you are not compliant, we will cancel the call of agreement with those contractors. And this is something that has been active in, within our due diligence system today. We're also working with Q22, the tournament organizers, and FIFA to increase our involvement in the pre-tournament due diligence phase, an integral part of the process. Um, and this is particularly during the procurement process. We want to identify the human rights risks covering security service contractors and provide rectifications in advance of the World Cup. Another challenge, for example, was in relation to enforcing our standards on security companies being contracted by external stakeholders for the tournament. Again, there are several stakeholders at play here. and All of them will be deploying private security. We wanted to engage with them early on to make sure that they understand uh, the law, the standards, and are applying it vis-a-vis uh, -vis their, their staff and workers. We're liaising closely with those stakeholders. We've done this, of course, you know, obviously with even the football federations and associations, as well as other FIFA rights holders that are going to be deploying, uh, they could be potentially deploying security st uh, staff to make sure that they understand the standards and that they carry out their own due diligence of these companies. And we're providing advisory support and services to them in this process. We're also working with security service contractors and other ones that obviously one of the key issues that we have faced uh, is the systemic um, you know, excessive use of working hours that happen with security guards. You know, They work around the clock and this is quite prevalent obviously in the security sector, often working double shifts for a duration of up to 12 hours. We are liaising very closely with the Ministry of Labor to either enforce the eight hour shifts or increase rest periods so that working hours do not exceed the 10 hours per day mandated by labor law. Now, despite these challenges, we have made significant progress in establishing best practice through our collaborative engagement, which can be implemented by any other organization, frankly, that is hosting a mega event. First one is security personnel working on our project. And this is something quite prevalent in Qatar. And of course, it's a global issue of unethical recruitment fees. Over 25 million workers are plagued by this, uh, by this horrendous practice. We introduced a scheme in 2017 uh, termed, uh, as we termed it, the SC's Universal Reimbursement Scheme. Now, this groundbreaking initiative effectively uh, was a remedy to right the wrong that companies have uh, made to workers that have paid illegal recruitment fees in their home countries. In total to date, after uh, you know, three, three to four years now, we're really going after this particular uh, challenge, 2,266 contractors across our program have agreed to reimburse about 27 million euros to SC, Supreme Committee, and non-Supreme Committee workers over a 36-month period. And this, of course, this impacts you know, a significant amount of workers that have been impacted negatively and, and in, a, in a very, very difficult way uh, by the payment of unethical recruitment fees. And to date, 20, 22 million uh, euros has been reimbursed to these workers. So we have actuals. I mean, now we're not talking about effectively commitments. We're actually talking about actual figures that have gone back in the pockets of these workers. Six out of the eight companies that I mentioned earlier, the security, security, security service contractors have committed to this practice and this scheme as well. And they've reimbursed roughly 2 million euros. Mamboud, if I could just step in, um, just bear in mind the time. Uh, before uh, moving on to um, Eddie, and we'll unpack some of the issues as well. Could I also ask you a very quick question uh, linked to the, the sustainability of these uh, elements and practices that you put into place? Because we are talking about a fairly important migrant population of security providers, and there's all the human rights issues and considerations that you've uh, talked about in terms of their welfare, recruitment fees, and the likes. But what happens after uh, the World Cup? If I could so get you on that for like maybe one or two minutes, because that is a big question of, you have these thousands of um, you know, third country nationals in Qatar, security providers out of contract. Uh, what is the plan in terms of long-term sustainability and their welfare in that regard? Yeah, no, absolutely. And of course, sustainability of this program is absolutely essential. And again, this is the point of the legacy element. And of course, you know, the, the reimbursement scheme that I mentioned, it affected both Supreme Committee and non-Supreme Committee. These are companies that are operating in Qatar and will continue to operate even after the World Cup. So the fact that they subscribe to the scheme is, a, is actually quite encouraging and very, very, uh, very positive uh, move. Uh, similarly with private security, of course, they'll play a key role in Qatar even after the tournament. 
Uh, now, again, the, the, the engagement with this sector, we have, and this is primarily why, Jamie, we've been focusing heavily on knowledge sharing and capacity building. And mm -hmm. this is absolutely crucial. We want to equip them with the necessary tools to safeguard workers' rights and comply with Qatar labor law. And we're extending this exercise to contractors, effectively across other sectors as well. I mentioned hospitality. And this is the first time really, I think, you know, on a global scale that the hospitality sector is being scrutinized to this extent. This program that we have done, and obviously our team has been very much in, involved in this, you know, to raise the bar and ensure that they understand their, their rights against the, you know, sort of business and human rights and their obligations towards SAP, both the direct hires as well as the indirect hires, subcontractors, security guards, and others. This is absolutely essential. Um, look, we're already seeing the legacy in action. One of the important elements that we've also introduced very closely with the ILO and the Ministry of Labor, which I think is worth highlighting, is, for example, worker representation. Worker yeah. representation is critical. Um, and we have a flagship system called the Workers Welfare Forums, which has now has served as a model for similar joint committees that have been rolled out across the nation to support worker representation. We're encouraging social dialogue. Today, we, there was a discussion with the ILO, uh, where we appointed uh, representatives at a sectoral level in hospitality to meet jointly within the hotels to share knowledge, best practice, and due diligence. And this is an absolutely positive sign and really another key testament to the sustainability of the programs that we have introduced. Super. Uh, Mahmoud, I'm going to have to pause you here. I say pause because we will come back, no doubt, to a number of issues you've uh, mentioned already, but um, a fascinating, I think, tour de force in terms of the, the construction phase to where we are now and the range of issues that one has to tackle. I think one particular point uh, which I felt was uh, important is that third party kind of verification uh, or the support that entities uh, you mentioned uh, as part of social audits, uh, something that ICOCA does as well with regard to prior security providers to come in and help and support the national authorities in that oversight of capacity building of security providers and addressing any concerns that they may have. So we'll definitely try to come back to a number of those issues because I think you covered a wide range of issues like David as well. Um, so I'm going to make a very quick segue now to Eddie, uh, because Eddie has been working quite a bit uh, also in Qatar, uh, very much focusing on those welfare issues that you mentioned, uh, um, Mahmoud, uh, in your comments on the working conditions of guards and on the questions of, you know, um, the, the representation uh, for uh, or available to uh, security guards as uh, personnel and their representations uh, in countries. And Eddie, I mean, the question for you is, you know, are there any particular lessons learned that we can take from this? Uh, in terms of the focus now on private security guards, on the conditions uh, of work, on their recruitment, on uh, third country nationals being brought into a, a country to help in a mega sporting event. From your experiences, uh, have you come across any sort of you know, good practices, bad practices as well? And what can we learn from your work in Qatar? Any floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so let me get back to your question uh, in my uh, in the presentation I prepared. And, uh, but uh, first of all, many of you have probably no idea who any global union is. We, we are a global federation of unions. We bring together 20 million workers in the service economy, over 150 different countries. And our main job is to win better jobs and better lives for people. That's what we do. And that's what our unions do. And Uni Property Services has 155 affiliated unions in 60 countries. And we represent about 1 million members, members in the cleaning and private security industry. We have, um, UNI as a whole has 50 global framework agreements with multinationals. In private security, we have a great framework agreement with Allied G4S, and we have one with Securitas. And these agreements, they guarantee the core workers' rights, and we have a, 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 a frequent dialogue with these companies to make sure that, that it is implemented. As, uh, as for our work in Qatar, uh, we are active in Qatar since the opening of the ILO office in Qatar in 2018. And our work is part of the technical cooperation agreement. We monitor and we advise the government on, uh, on the reforms and the implementation of the reforms. Uh, for me, particularly for the private security sector. And, um, and we inform the workers about their rights under these reforms, as well as assist them with grievances. Um, you have to understand Qatar doesn't have freedom of association, so we are pretty much handicapped by that. So other than in other countries where we would support a union to do this work, we do the union work ourselves uh, within the limitations of uh, the, the Qatari system. So it's, it's a bit, um, it takes a, 
let's say uh, the maximum of my diplomatic skills to uh, to move around in this <laughs> in this uh, within these restrictions. So um, to do so, to gather information, we we have social media sites on Facebook. We have a lot of WhatsApp groups. So we have contact with workers, with hundreds of workers, and we have a community liaison officer on the ground. That's the name that it was given. Um, who is uh, collecting grievances for, from people and trying to find systematical errors. And I take part in the biannual meetings with uh, the Ministry of Labor and ILO uh, to, see, to discuss the progress. Uh, the World Cup in, in Qatar is, is a unique event. I'm, I'm also involved in discussions about the World Cup in, in the Americas, but it's a totally different event because this is like a, a very large global sports event, but uh, in scale, but if you put it in Qatar, the compact, it, it is very compact. I mean, it's, it's a very small area. The, the maximum distance between stadiums is, is 55 kilometers. And, and almost every infrastructure is specially developed and built for this event. Um, and it's built in, and developed in a way that it's also usable afterwards. But it was not there before. It's built in the last 10 years. Metro, train, uh, tram, uh, uh, highways, football stadiums, hotels, you name it. So that also explains the massive migrant workforce being almost 90% of Qatar's population. And my experience in Qatar is that we had landslide reforms, especially in the perspective of, of, of the Gulf states, and workers did gain rights and protection. And the Qatar government should be complimented on that because they are, they are pushing pretty hard on that. And, and in my in my context, I think it's a sincere and, and sustainable attempt to improve the situation. Then I come to what we on, see on the ground. We see too many excesses and remnants of kafala in the behavior of employers. Maybe kafala is not there anymore in law, in legislation, but it's there in the heads of many employers. And um, it's a big, challenge to prevent and remedy those excesses. Uh, and, 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 and looping back to what Mahmoud was explaining, with all the respect of the work of, 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 of the Supreme Committee, I see, uh, I can confirm what he says about it. There's a lot of progress made and there's like the payback scheme is going and it's an example for the rest. Um, but there's very few clients and, and, and unfortunately the, the, the Supreme, Supreme Committee is not the only client there, there's many more. There's very few clients who actually, uh, who actually have a due diligence system on their suppliers. Uh, and the ones who do, like the Supreme Committee, like the Qatar Foundation, like the North Atlantic College, like uh, Hamad Hospital, the ones who do, uh, the workers that work directly for, for this client, they are good. But the rest of the workforce of that same company, not. That's what we see a lot. We see, for instance, if, if you talk about uh, uh, accommodation, there's a few accommodations that are really meeting uh, uh, ILO standards of, of, of workers' housing. And that's where people get moved when they work for these specific clients. And the rest of the work, to, the, the rest of, rest of the workforce might stay in some farm. And that happens. So it's a big challenge. There are over 70 registered private security companies. Uh, we don't know the actual number of workers, but we estimate that at the moment it's around 40, 45,000. Uh, most of them are local. Only three are franchises of multinational brands. And they are, most of them are purely local. And there's fierce competition, as you all know, in every market, and it's pushing compliance down. And most companies, most security companies are part of, of large family owned conglomerates. So uh, private security is just a side business in the conglomerate. You, you can buy a tractor, you can buy a car and you can buy a, a private security services from the same company on the different names. And it's very hard to, hard to identify these companies and who is leading these companies and how they are connected to their clients because Qatar is a very small community with 300,000 people. Uh, uh, many of the top of Qatar have uh, more than, uh, than, than one wife and also many children. So there's many family relations that are very hard to, to crack down. 
So you have to navigate through that and find out how you can move things. So FIFA gave us, gave us a spotlight on, and, and a lot of leverage. And we gratefully use that leverage. And we're very happy that we can work with ILO and the government to improve the situation and showcase it for the Gulf states. Uh, and if other Gulf states would do what Qatar did, it would already be a big improvement. But I would say around the world, private security jobs are amongst the lower pay, lowest paced jobs in the formal economy. And businesses in many geographies are depending on internal and external migrants. And Qatar shows us some of the abuse these migrant workers face in many parts of the world, like overcrowded dormitories. You can find that in London, you can find it in Amsterdam, you can find it uh, uh, in, the, in the south of the United States. Uh, people who are receiving their salaries too, too late or too little or incorrectly calculated, unfair dismissal, bullying, harassment, and a lot of tactics to keep vulnerable workers captured are not limited to Qatar, unfortunately. And I do understand there's a lot of pressure from competition and especially in this sector, I hear it all the time. But if the sector doesn't set its own standards, we all will sink further at the cost of human dignity of these workers until standards are forced upon by authorities, which happened in a few geographies. We have, a, we have, we have several good examples how to raise the standard and how that can be for the benefit of all. If we raise the standard, it's not only good for workers, but it's good for the company too. And, and while the spotlights are giving us leverage on mega sports event, we should not only use that, to le that leverage to where the spotlights accidentally are, but we should highlight and promote best practices across this global industry. This global industry that is uh, of growing importance, that is replacing um, uh, public services in many places, um, where police is going, is going on downsizing, private security is going on upscaling. Uh, it's a growing industry. And I think at the end of the day, uh, the reputation of a, of a private security company comes to integrity. That's like the most important uh, unique selling point you have, be in uh, integrity. And uh, there's a lot of work to do on that. And there's a lot of things that happen in the world that that global leaderships of companies don't see or don't want to see or don't want to hear. And you can easily sort of hide it behind a, a nice uh, website page about your intentions and, 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 and maybe a whistleblower's channel and that sort of thing. But the reality is a very tough one. And, and I think we all have to work hard to improve these standards. And then coming back to... Uh, to Qatar, uh, Qatar is in that sense an example. And it's very tough for me to say that because where I work in the environment where I work is not so much enthusiasm about working in this environment, but in the years I've been there, I, I'm, I'm proud to be part of this, 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 this change, uh, but it's a hard job. It's a very, very hard job and it's very tough what you face in, in reality. I mean, there's some places where I visited and where I was not supposed to visit, where crying is closer than, than laughing, I can tell you. So it's a, a lot to do. Thank you. Yeah, on that, thank you um, for those, I think, candid comments. And I think also the recognition of the efforts that are being taken to improve things, but also some of the challenges which do remain. And I think the numbers you mentioned here, sort of the 40, 45,000 uh, security providers, you know, spread amongst them, and that's a huge number uh, for you know both the construction as well as the sporting event and beyond, and no doubt a huge range of welfare issues that need to be addressed. Now, uh, you mentioned already, uh, Eddie, before, as I make the segue to um, Nula, the issue in terms of uh, you know the, the leverage and where the influence uh, and who can you know bring about that kind of uh, impactful, uh, positive change in addressing the issues in what is a particularly important. Uh, sector and a growing sector, which is private security, and which is quite often seen as a bit of an invisible sector that no one takes uh, too seriously, and are actually too often uh, seen quite negatively, that as soon as a uniform is put on, uh, individuals are treated uh, with a lesser standard. So, Eddie, uh, thank you for your comments. We'll hopefully come back. We have time on some of the other issues. I'm going to turn to Nula. Thank you very much for your patience. 
Um, I hesitated in interrupting too many people because there was so much uh, richness in the content of everyone. Um, so maybe sort of looking at you and being taking somewhat different perspective. So we focused on the management of the security uh, of the uh, the event itself, and David unpacked some of those issues linked to uh, risk mitigation, procurement processes, and the likes. Uh, Mahmoud spoke about the role that the organizers, the host nation, and the likes of FIFA, for instance, uh, uh, have to play uh, in regard to ensuring that uh, welfare of security personnel are particularly managed and that security companies are held accountable for wrongdoings. But then there's that whole other sort of network of stakeholders. Mega sporting events is also big business. It's great sport, mm -hmm. not always, uh, but it's also big business. And with big business, you not only have the, the sites, which are the, the sporting facilities, but then we have everything linked to where the athletes are being housed, uh, hospital, I mean, um, hotels, airports, transports, and then all the corporate sector, the sponsors. Mm -hmm. So in your mind, I mean, do they have a role to play? in driving the standards up, in supporting the regulators, in supporting the organizers, uh, in trying to address security uh, issues and human rights issues linked to the security uh, world? Thanks, Nila. Uh, thanks, Jamie. That's, uh, that's a lot of questions. It is um, indeed. I apologize. And, but, if, but to be fair, it is, I mean, there's, there was so much covered already. So you're right. This is, I suppose, my remarks are probably a change of direction from the operational into the psychological, to be fair, but also then into the commercial. Um, in, into into what sponsors um, actually play, what they expect, um, and, and what role they might play. Um, but I do think this is about initially. I do think that part of this whole debate is about getting into the mind of the the private security decision maker, if you like, the people who make the decisions um, and the choices that companies make in choosing a security provider. You know, is not insignificant. Um, you know, companies can either choose to do nothing. You know make a new decision, not make any decision at all. Um, but initially people face at least 200 psychological barriers. I mean, there are 200 biases that affect how organizers assess that risk that we just heard about, the standards, whether they contract suppliers or terminate contracts. And I just want to point out a couple very briefly. Um, the first one, for example, most decision makers think it's just too costly to change. They don't want to change. So, you know, they've done events a certain way. And that attitude compels not just the organizers, but also broadcasters to maintain the current situation, even when alternatives, uh, better alternatives exist. It's probably why we would stay in the same job or buy the same brand. You know, organizers keep familiar but underperforming suppliers. And change is just too much effort. And we like easy. And psychologists will call that status quo bias. But equally, managing private security is important, but people don't see it as a priority now, despite the burgeoning pipeline of events that are coming up in sports. Now, the events of Paris may shift this temporarily, because in our mind, it's all very salient. And I saw some questions coming in um, on the chat there about this. But this is short term present bias, and it is the human default. So we tend to think about uh, the present over the future and that makes sure that actually we just stay doing the same thing as before and I think that really plays to you know the importance of the, of the training that, that David and Mahmoud also referenced earlier on. The other reason why we get stuck and don't move and address this issue quicker than we should is the fact that the, the human mind just automatically looks for information that we think already so you know we've done events a certain way we reject anything that doesn't Work. And this is this is endemic everywhere. So we look for evidence from suppliers or our clients or existing existing colleagues that we that supports our hypothesis. So when we do this, it's we narrow our options. People call this confirmation bias, and it's it's evident in juries, businessmen, firefighters, every single solitary profession, and it's equally evident in sports fans. You know the stewards, every single person that's involved in this world exhibits this tendency and we're just not aware enough of it to shift ourselves into into making you know the, the world a better place and addressing these human rights issues the other uh, thing is that you know you may see these human rights issues and um, but you just don't want to know about them so so we just you know switch off the ostrich effect i think sets in and even really smart uh, leaders ignore uncomfortable or negative information that we see as threatening or we have we're too optimistic. We don't think that these events will happen. I mean, we thought in tennis, for example, you know, people were completely under in the pandemic. 
major sporting events were affected. I think Wimbledon was one of the few sporting events that were insured and had this uh, written into their contract. And, you know, they, they, they collected a check on the back of it. But most organisations didn't. And because we don't we don't think that any of these things you know, will happen to us. So your question, you know, how can organisations be persuaded to choose responsible providers when there may be a cost differential? Um, at the end of the day, you look to the, pers the persuasion sciences. It makes sense. How do you get people to make the to make decisions that they don't really want to make? Well, you just apply to the everybody has mentioned reputation risk. You apply these levers to the C-suite. At the end of the day, you know whether it's the PNL, product speed, reputation, or regulation. You shift perspective by appealing to these kind of elements rather than just price, even though it is long term. And if you choose to position human rights within a broader context as an opportunity for differentiation, an opportunity for the Olympics or the next Rugby World Cup. And you link it to this, you know, topics of ESG as well. You make an emotional appeal by retelling the story, and this does shift behaviour. And there's decades of science that show you how this is the case. And if you think of the frame that you use, you can't rely on codes of conduct and manuals to prevent these human rights violations. Um, but if you use the the particular more positive frames. And occasionally the negative fear-based frames, it does work. And most PLCs and broadcasters, you know, will tend to, to, to look at these frames and contract known brands. So brands that they are familiar with, which isn't risk-free, um, obviously. So your other question about who is best placed to do to make you know these, these persuasions is well, again, if you rely on how how people make decisions, we all know that we're influenced by people that we admire. Or people that are close to us, but mostly the common thread is people who are familiar. So people who are familiar, or people who we feel are similar to us. And um, we, we, we Mahmoud referenced, you know, using the Middle Eastern bodies to accelerate change, using relationship and that appeal to legacy. I think makes a difference. And I think is very effective. And we underestimate how that can affect change by by looking. To the different elements, people are twice as likely to say yes to requests than you may think, and it's equally effective in this space. Maybe we don't make enough demands on, on you know, private security companies or on the multinationals that, that hire them and just assume that these changes are being made in, in the system. So a couple of things you can do. I mean, you know, behavioral science teaches us that we don't change minds but we change behavior by changing tweaks to messages, processes, and, and the messengers. I would refer to ICOCA, to be fair, in this case. Redesigning the process, making something easy, is the fundamental reason why anything gets done. The, the ICOCA guide is a very simple guide for procurement, and it helps to make people move forward in the right direction. It's a very simple way of, 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 of you know, affecting change. Redesigning comms, we talk, heard about it already, you know, whether it's to the fans, just as much as to the stewards or private security, whether it's to make sure that there aren't those pitch incursions. I think Graham uh, was asking that in the chat. You know, how do you stop these pitch incursions, fans running onto the pitch? You know, is it the stewards' responsibility? I mean, we've, we've seen it several times, and I know the FA is certainly looking at it, but there needs to be, you know, a role, and there's a role for the clubs, just as much as there are, are, are is a role for the actual organizers. So as a as a former, you know, sponsor of these mega sporting events, I mean, I was involved with the Ryder Cup, the British and, I, and Irish Lions, the ATP tennis tours. And in each of these occasions, when I as a sponsor uh, looked at this, certainly even though as an investment company, human rights was on our agenda, uh, ESG was on our agenda, we made the logical assumption and delegated responsibility that the organizers would be looking after these, um, these areas. But I think now in hindsight, I think that actually the role of the sponsors is enormous and could play significant uh, weight in terms, in terms of putting pressure. I mean, we saw even today, um, you know, DWS in, in Germany, for example, was raided for greenwashing. Companies today vote on executive pay companies can take a really strong role in making sure that, that, that suppliers 
and um, rights holders and broadcasters are making sure that these human rights obligations are being fulfilled. And I know that there are a couple of questions on that in the chat, but I do think that it is an opportunity for sponsors to step up and to make sure that, you know, that the right motivations, the right incentives, the right training is put in place in all of these huge organizations. Because at the end of the day, these events don't take place without the sponsors. And again, making sure that, that the right appeals, whether it's through ICOQuest, whether it's through FIFA, whether it's through any of these major organizations, I think working in partnership with corporate sponsors, I think could make an absolutely huge uh, difference in this space. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Nula. And, and there's a couple of points there which I found uh, a bit concerning, but also uh, gives us a bit sort of an opportunity to uh, go into a bit more detail in terms of our work beyond this webinar, is the, the failure to address the risk or to see the risk. I think the, that first point, the fact we take it for granted, everything's fine, and we refuse to see uh, the potential for risks. But I think the discussions we've had today so far have demonstrated actually uh, in the management of security and uh, the relationships with human rights as such, there are potentially a huge number of risks that need to be addressed. And we can't simply, uh, you know, ignore them or be blind to them. And that's something we, know, we see not only in the sporting sector, I dare say, uh, but also in many other sectors. And as Eddie quite rightly mentioned, it's a huge uh, industry in terms of the private security world, which has been used in so many different sectors, but we need to work uh, to ensure that there's greater visibility of key issues. The second point was that question on delegated responsibility. And we see that in other sectors too, uh, the question of duty of care. And the fact that there's this presumption that, well, because I'm hiring someone else, they've got everything under control because they have their responsibilities and standards to which they need to uh, adhere to. When in actual fact, uh, that is either potentially a false sense of confidence, potentially uh, reckless in some, on some occasions, because there is still that responsibility upstream as well uh, for those hiring the security providers and others to ensure that their providers are meeting certain international standards, are ensuring that their welfare is taken into account, are addressing any potential grievances. Uh, I'm going to pause on this side. Time's flown by, uh, which is a good thing, I presume. Uh, we're about 11 or so minutes. So what I'm suggesting to do, rather than trying to uh, pitch questions myself, I'm actually going to go back to uh, David, who has his hand up uh, already, which is good, um, and then uh, ask each of you in turn, if you wouldn't mind just going to the Q&A. I know you've answered quite a few questions already live, but maybe taking some of the questions you see in the Q&A and uh, tackling those in a sort of few minutes that we have uh, so that we give the participants uh, the answers they, they deserve uh, having listened to this webinar. And, you know, I was looking simply at Craig uh, Dorrington's question, uh, which maybe all of you might want to address, which is, you know, training isn't sufficient. And I think quite a provocative a question, but maybe a fair one, uh, that personnel being recruited are jacket fillers and lack core competencies. So that is a provocative question, but maybe that's something we can look at as well in terms of standards, training and capacity building. So David, you had your hand up, so I'll give you the floor, uh, either a question that you want to address specifically or an additional comment. I was, uh, so I was we have about build... 12 minutes left or there. Okay, I'll be, I'll be very quick then. I, I, I was going to build on something you said. Um, I can tell you nothing focused my mind more as a chief executive of a major sporting event than understanding truly what duty of care meant. Um, and that was helped by both <laughs> all of the various uh, security briefings I would receive and understanding what I was actually supposed to do with that information. And then secondly, the health and safety executive. So whether it was my employees, the volunteers we were recruiting, or the contracted staff, uh, in accordance with the uh, UK uh, health and safety executive, I was liable. <laughs> As a, as a chief executive. And so there was this looming, you will go to jail if you are negligent and you do not take health and safety and security and safety seriously. Um, and so it became a part of an ongoing narrative, but something I also sought to seek in terms of my leadership style and also uh, part of my um, just kind of commitment to self and others. And so that was something that uh, certainly was, a, I think, a. <laughs> Uh, a wake-up call um, or a coming of age. I'm not sure uh, which one. A quick question, if I may, David, just a follow-up on that one. From a, let's say, technical perspective, 
Do you make a difference between health and safety and human rights? No. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I've been practicing human rights work uh, for, for, for years without recognizing. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about, you know, there's a basis and a foundation for most of our interactions uh, socially, culturally, uh, uh, you know, operationally that is based in good, this respect, protection and promotion and fulfillment of human rights. We just don't call it that. So mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges we, we have within the human rights and labor, labor movements is to demystify some of this language and make it, make it more uh, understandable, accessible and, uh, and, and vice versa. I think it, you know, you also the world of, uh, the, the, the world of, uh, uh, of civil society organizations and so forth, understanding sport better. And I think this is getting, we're, we're all of us getting off of our uh, uh, respective pyramids and actually recognizing we're part of this ecosystem is something that's really, it, it's a, it is a bit of a mind shift that we're all in this together and that engagement and asking those often very, very difficult questions that have difficult answers um, mm -hmm. But then, how do we move from there? Is absolutely critical in this in this space. So I I think the UNGPs, you know, provide a fantastic uh, point to commit to a process, commit to fundamental pr principles, um, exercise an honest, good due diligence, uh, risk assessment or impact assessment process, have well published and transparent um, you know, uh, actions and, and, and policies that are put out there to, to mitigate those risks and harness those opportunities and then regularly communicate. You know, it is a wonderful system in which to, to use yeah. and engage. And I, and I fundamentally think that in particularly in the private security area, you know, it is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's critical, it's absolutely critical. Um, exactly. Sure, it's good to hear that. I mean, exactly. That's the field that we're in and trying to bring in that human rights due diligence through the UNGPs to the private security world. Mahmoud, I'm going to turn to you. I know I interrupted you a bit earlier. Um, I don't know if there's any particular question you want to pick up from the chat. One I would have, and it goes back to that uh, feedback loop that you had. There's a feedback loop internally. There's a question which came up in terms of the, the number of, let's say, uh, individuals who are able to support the, the welfare workers and to be able to supervise uh, the work that you have in that regard and working with personnel. I don't have the question in front of me, it just popped up, but it's linked to welfare. But the question that I have for you also more specifically from an organizational perspective, can you see there being as part of the process, but also beyond some important lessons learned for FIFA directly for future sporting events, because we have the unity bid from 2026, but also beyond FIFA, uh, is there maybe an ambition to build some of these human rights and security lessons learned and provide a set of best practices uh, to other uh, sporting, we call them foundations, associations, organizations at a global level. My wood floors is yours. Yeah, you may just need to unmute. A short answer, Jamie, to the question regarding FIFA. And of course, David will probably be a better person to respond to that because Mary Harvey played an integral role, in fact, in the uh, in the bidding, uh, the bidding strategy of Mary Harvey being the CEO, of course, of the Center for Sports and Human Rights, uh, and ensure this was as a result of the World Cup in Qatar. I think this was something that was integrated within the bidding phase, uh, where human rights became an integral component of the uh, of the bids for 2026, and there was a dedicated chapter to that. During my time, there used to be a sustainability chapter, mm -hmm. which of course is, was important, and we touched on the human impact and the social impact that the World Cup will have on the wider society. I was very much involved in that with my team. But of course, having a dedicated chapter on human rights and ensuring that the World Cup can advance the cause of human rights and labor rights is integral. FIFA has absolutely done so. They have obviously a dedicated team uh, of individuals focusing on human rights and anti-discrimination. Uh, we work very closely with them, Andreas Graf and others. And of course, they have passed their human rights strategy, which is a, an important document, in fact, uh, you know, which obviously sort of um, ensures and, and communicates FIFA's commitment uh, to human rights, ensuring that mega events uh, from all of FIFA, not just the World Cup, specifically the Men's World Cup, but all events obviously adhere to the highest levels of, of human rights, business and human rights. 
from our perspective, Jamie, uh, you know, knowledge sharing, as I mentioned, has been has been an absolutely integral mm -hmm. uh, process, integral system that we've been, we've uh, we've embodied from the beginning. Uh, both for us, we wouldn't have attained the level of success that we have in this particular field. Eddie mentioned this is hard work. This is very hard work. It's not just hard work. It's very hard work. Uh, and it requires a lot of resilience, a lot of patience and perseverance. Um, you know, you, you have to generally be optimistic day in, day out that you're changing the lives of thousands of workers. And it starts one person at a time. Where we are today is very much different from where we were when we first set out in 2009. I can, I can certainly give you that assurance that there's been continuous improvement day in, day out. And there's a lot of good, good practices that are happening. And I'm very optimistic uh, that leveraging on the collective efforts of the wider stakeholders, whether it's the ILO, whether it's UNI, the Center for Sports and Human Rights and other partners, I think it's absolutely essential to come together. You need solutions for the context of Qatar. This is quite unique. This is not Russia. This is not Brazil. It is Qatar. It is, the, it is the GCC, and obviously the commitment by the government to dismantle the Kafala system is the first step. Certainly not the end goal, no doubt. Monitoring and enforcement is integral. We have demonstrated through our particular platform that what we have done can be scaled, and that's key. And I think this is where I think from our perspective, uh, to see what has been achieved on the hospitality sector in a very short period of time, and the commitment that the hospitality sector has made has been absolutely encouraging. That there's been a shared commitment by the hospitality sector uh, to really improve their operations. And of course, they're using the World Cup and Qatar as the custodian to improve their practices globally. I mean, we're dealing with the global chains here, the multinationals that have practices all over the world, operations all over the world, and the supply chain very much similar to the supply chain of the construction sector. So we're very optimistic. I mean, I think we're headed in the right direction. Um, and I think, again, in knowledge sharing and ensuring that that is cascaded and integrated within the wider fabric of mega events is absolutely essential. Well, thank you very much, Mahmoud. Um, Eddie, I'll come back to you fairly quickly. So we have a you know, handful of minutes. Uh, we'll maybe overshoot the half past mark and hopefully that'll be fine for all of you. Um, question I had, it comes up quite often. It's a question of welfare and reporting and the issues of uh, grievance mechanisms. How have you found that to be in terms of the access to grievance mechanisms and the ability for secure providers who feel that they've been uh, ill-treated or have substandard conditions to actually report their grievances and to have them addressed um, there, 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 there effectively. Are good, there are good mechanisms in place. You can uh, download an app on your phone, the matras, and you can do all kinds of things and report all kinds of situations there. <clears throat> the follow-up is sometimes a bit slow and uh, sometimes we have to help them push a bit. But uh, you also have to consider that the labor inspection uh, was 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 built from 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 zero to three hundred people in, in in three years time and it's still it's still in the learning curve. I mean, it's a big organization now and they're still in the learning curve, so it doesn't always work the way it should work. But in principle, it's there. The problem, however, is do people feel safe enough to report things? And with harassment and intimidation that is going on on a on a on a very common scale. And then you also have to understand something about the, 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 there is some racial div division in in in, the, in in hierarchy in 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 the workforce. You know, you have a you have the an African population, an Asian population. Then you have a North uh, a North African population that speaks Arabic and mostly is somewhere in the lower middle man management section. And 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 there's some animosity between these groups. And then you have like a, 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 a Sudanese who have been there a longer time and who have often a bit higher position. Uh, and, and, and there's a sort of, there's a sort of a, what I call a father hits mother, mother hits child and child kicks dog. That sort of pressure is going on all the time. So it, people are very scared. The people who contact us in general, they are, extremely scared that they will be traceable if we if we report it so what i do is actually i don't i, I just don't put a black mark on on documents i have I, I really make sure that even in the mega data you cannot find back where it comes from and that people and i tell them and it's not so much that i don't trust the authorities but that's how i gain trust with people and that's how i get the stories out and that's how we get issues on the ministry of labor that they didn't know of i mean they had the Ministry of Labor had a strike at their own front door and, and, and they didn't know what the strike was about. So we mediated, we, we gave them the, the contracts that were 
that were uh, that were uh, not valid uh, that they would never have gotten if 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 we were not in between and making sure that these people were anonymized so that's that's the problem there people are scared yeah. everybody is scared to to lose their job and to be exported there's 12000 uh, deported there's 12000 people every year being deported for according to some figures so there's a big scare for being deported People say, we are not only here for our own future, we're feeding a family and the family at home is relying on the few dollars that we make. And we do have a minimum wage, but it's still a few dollars, you know, it's not like a, a big bag of cash. So it's, it's uh, actually we're discussing of raising the minimum wage, wage but that's still a difficult discussion. Um, but exactly. yeah. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, exactly. So the question of the, the, the confidence uh, in being able to in, in wanting to report and uh, the fear mm. for their own security and safety and having those channels made available, not only the existence of those channels, but the confidence in the mechanism which has been offered and potentially the uh, the remedies that go with that. And, Lula, and, uh, and, uh, and I'll give you the Mahmoud last word. Probably can confirm. Uh, there's a few questions. Yep. Mahmoud yep, probably can confirm the fear for... for uh, uh, an organization called the search and follow-up department which is actively deporting people people are dead scared for that you know and they have yeah. a bad reputation and they ad actually they advocate uh, they make a newspaper article like we will find you and we will get you out so that doesn't help and that's what I, why my message to the Qatari authorities is too don't make labor law migration law and criminal law don't mix it up uh, Nula last words to you um, well, I, I would just I would just add to Eddie's questions. point. Yeah. I just add to Eddie's point, if I may. There, um, I've done a huge amount of research on on whistleblowing and exactly that point. And I found that even in big, you know, organisations, the problem isn't just getting people to speak up, as you say. The problem is how it's dealt with. So I think you know we don't have time for it now, but I'm very happy to speak to anyone who's interested in. There are using behavioural science. There are some pretty established ways of. You know, you can't just encourage people to speak up and then not be able to, to treat the problem once it happens. Um, but but there has been an awful lot of work I've done in this space to make it easier. And then to tr it's not just train the employees um, or, or the people who have the issues to complain. It's also how to train um, to, to, to train people to how to deal with it. And that is a serious, you know, area of development in huge organizations. So I think that plays to the themes that we've been talking about today, the need to train, not just the private security people, but also everyone else who's involved in the process. And the grievance of peace is absolutely huge, but it does start with speaking up. And then when you speak up, having it dealt with appropriately. Thank you very much, Shula. We've seemingly run out of time. It's flown by, um, which means that I hope it was interesting for everyone. Mahmoud, you have a hand up. I can give you a minute before I think the technical guys cut me off. Uh, but please go ahead and then I'll uh, close up. Thank you, Jamie. No, just a, just a quick response to, to Eddie's point. Look, at the end of the day, as I mentioned, it is a journey. Where, where people were 10 years out, where they are today, uh, I think we have seen, what I can do is I, I'll tell you, I speak from other systems that we've established, the forums, there are the, the joint committees. We have seen a, the issues that have arisen over the years change from just commenting on food being not, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, within their sort of comfort zone in terms of their culture, to getting into really the nuts and bolts of the issues, such as delayed salaries, ethical recruitment. Uh, the workers are a lot more confident than they were. They do speak out. There are systems in place, and this is what we're working towards, the joint committees, the forums. These are systems that are in place that are really, you know, giving them the confidence that they can raise issues without fear of retaliation. Are there select cases that do exist? These are things obviously without, without, without outside of our remit, Certainly there may be. We do know that when there is an MOL or a Ministry of Labor dispute or a case that has been brought, these individuals you know, will get the attention that they require in due course. We are not aware, of course, of any system in place that has, been, that has uh, removed individuals or sent them back home you know, throughout a case that is being, withheld, being held uh, at the dispute committee. So again, the systems need to be fine-tuned, there's no doubt. Uh, no one will, will, will ever project that there is a perfect system in place. But we are certainly seeing positive signs, I think, towards getting something that's much more enhanced, uh, much more adapt to the culture of the society. And there's a willingness. Look, I think what's important here, as I mentioned earlier, and I continue to, to, to really put emphasis on the point of collective action, is that Qatar has embraced scrutiny. They've embraced uh, criticism. 
in a, so long as it's positive criticism that comes in that is very, very much focused on trying to improve the situation in Qatar. And they've welcomed the organization to come and speak and they partnered with the ILO and other global organizations in order to do that. So, so there is an acknowledgement that there are issues that need to be resolved. And there is a journey that everyone has to really sort of embark upon to work towards a sustainable effort uh, to fixing these issues. We don't want a Band-Aid solution to these problems. They must be sustained and they must be bought on and supported by all parties involved in that process. And I think all of us are really working towards that end goal uh, in our own different uh, uh, sort of uh, spheres of influence, if you will. Super, thank you, Hamoud. I'm gonna have to uh, bring this meeting, uh, was meeting this webinar um, to an end. Um, I, all I can do at this stage is, you know, I won't try to summarize everything, but certainly, uh, there's a whole range of issues that you have brought to the table in terms of uh, key elements, everything from the kind of the operational, the integrated, uh, let's say, missions uh, with the different sort of security actors in mega sporting events to the cycles in terms of everything from procurements, training, capacity building, ensuring that we're integrating human rights uh, and oversight from the very early stages, uh, starting with procurement the influence and role that each and everyone has to play, everything from the host nation, regulators, uh, to independent uh, voices and entities out there, um, third party verification bodies, organizations such as ICOCA, but also the corporate structures, uh, the sponsors involved in this, and the public uh, writ large that do have an influence on this. And I think also what each of you have pointed to in your own different ways is, there is this learning curve that we're on right now, and it's a journey. And I think we're still in a very, very early stage of addressing these questions linked to private security and human rights. And the more we can pick up from each and every one's experiences in terms of best practices and what can be done right, I think the better we will all end up in the long run. So I will thank you all. Uh, we have a shot in a little bit, so I hope you didn't have us for pressing engagements just after this webinar. For those of you who stayed on, to the, on the webinar, thank you very much. For the Q and A uh, questions, some provocative, some straightforward. Um, we'll print them out and send them to each of you in case there's anything you'd like to follow up on with individual participants. And for those who organised uh, behind the scenes this webinar, thank you very much. Uh, so with that, uh, again, thank you all. Uh, I enjoyed it, and uh, well, hopefully till next time. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks, Jamie.